when one is invited to speak long introductions are made i normally interrupt those introductions because the very fact that we have invited commander in chief julius malema here in itself is a testament to the fact that we have searched throughout the world and we have arrived at the conclusion that he is the one who is fit to be here so his very presence in this assembly is a testament to the fact that he is a pan-Africanist. It is not mine to talk about him. But when we talk about pan-Africanism today, we are talking about pan-Africanism in the context of those who preceded us. We are talking about pan-Africanism reminding ourselves of Sylvester Williams of Trinidad and Tobago who convened the first Pan-African meeting. We are reminding ourselves of Marcus Garvey. We are reminding ourselves of Pixley Kaisaka Seme of South Africa. We are reminding ourselves of W.B. Du Bois. We are reminding ourselves of John Henry Clark. We are reminding ourselves of Malcolm X of Martin Luther King Jr., of Robert Mangaliso Subukwe. We are reminding ourselves of Bantu Stephen Biko. We are reminding ourselves of Julius Kambarage Nyerere. We are reminding ourselves of Amilka Cabral of Elgesi. We are reminding ourselves of Ahmed Ben Bella, of Ahmed Sekoture, of Samora Moises Marshall, of Agostino Nato, and all those great men, Winnie, Matikezela, Mandela, we are reminding ourselves. And therefore, when we come here on this occasion of the Pan African Institute, we are reminding ourselves that we have philosophized for too long moralized for too long agonized for too long complained for too long criticized for too long critiqued for too long blamed others for too long we have allowed ourselves to be defined for too long and that the time is now to define ourselves the time is now to organize beyond organization. And that is why it gladdens my heart as I will in the next 30 minutes invite Commander-in-Chief Selo Malema to also invite to the stage individuals who will welcome him as the delivers his speech because it is these individuals whom we start with and through cross-fertilization of ideas, they are germinated the Pan-African Institute. That said, Juju, these are your people. Amanda! Maibuye! Maibuye! You don't know how to respond. When I say Amanda, you say Awet. When I say Maibuye, you say I Africa. And when I say I Africa, you say Maibuye. Amanda! Amanda! Maibuye! I Africa! Juju, speak to your people. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, let me take this opportunity to send revolutionary greetings to the esteemed professor, a friend of mine and a brother, PLO Lumumba. Let me also greet our mother, the founder of this important university, <laughs> Mama Mata Kasanga Mulwa and greet your, hubs, your husband wherever he is that he left us a lasting legacy that we stand to celebrate here today the leadership and academic staff our vice chancellor the chancellor is here and all 
the staff members who are here today to celebrate with us. And we also want to send our revolutionary greetings to the leadership of our province, what we call a province, a year you call the sub-national, the governor, and all the political, politically elected leaders who are here today. We are really grateful for your presence. Let me also send my greetings to the Lukenya University students and members of the community members of the media and fellow Africans. Today, it feels good to be African. Right here in Kenya, a place we call our home because all of Africa is our home. No one can ever say to me, welcome to Kenya or Lukenya or Nairobi, as if I'm a visitor. I regard no part of Africa as being foreign to me because Africa, all of it, belongs to me and I belong to Africa. It is a humbling, it's a humbling honor to be invited to address the launch of the prestigious Pan-African Institute, which is targeted at creating intellectual collaboration and unity amongst the people of the continent. Let us therefore begin by congratulating you on this initiative which is long overdue in light of the importance of the continent to reclaim its intellectual and academic identity within the global community in general. We know that ideas are at the core of the African capacity to chart its own destiny within the community of the world. Intellectual sovereignty has to be forced through research and development that is steeped in African experiences, African problems, and African questions. The economics, the economics of the African Academy have been part of the modalities of the broad draining of our resources. Because of lack of dedicated funding, many thinkers in the continent are taken in the general brain drain driven by Euro-American institutions. As we have seen over the decades, there is no way Euro-American is going to fund an intellectual project that will see Africa truly become intellectually sovereign. A truly sovereign Africa is a threat to the imperialist establishment that continue to determine the agenda and control of our resources. It is also inspiring to see that our esteemed Prof Lumumba and those who are joining him in this initiative have chosen our continent and Kenya in particular to establish an intellectual research and knowledge institution. Accordingly, our first duty is to call on sons and daughters of the continent, both based here and in the diaspora, to jealously fund this institute and ensure that it creates charts, create and charts a unique Africa based on an original thought because we have a duty to chart our own intellectual path. We are also inspired by the fact that the institute concept of Pan-Africanism include all people of African descent. That is, those in the continent, the Americas, Caribbean islands, Europe, and Asia. This is because wherever they are found, people who look like you and me continue to be treated as an inferior race. When you see a black person, when you see an African person, everywhere else in the continent, in the diaspora, and all over the world, please be kind to African people, for because they are a hated nation. Wherever they are, they are being enslaved, they are being tortured, they are being harassed. No one shows them love. But you, as an African who claim to be a pan-Africanist, you have a responsibility to show fellow Africans love and care. The violent, genocidal, and catastrophic transatlantic slave trade and colonialism 
are the historical twin towers that plugged the humanity of Africans into the dark night which to this day seem to have no end in sight. The image of the African as a black and subhuman was forged through massive and violent enslavement of millions of African people sold in the Americas as properties of white colonial settlers. In the coastal and mainland villages of West Africa, through the gun, the dogs, and the spears, African communities were plundered, captured against their will, and chained like animals. At the ports of, Ka of Ghana, those chained, naked, and malnourished bodies of men, women, and children were scaled, measured, and sold for cold, silver, or livestock. They were put in those gigantic ships that crossed thousands of kilometers of the massive body of violent and cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Millions will not survive the dangerous voyages on sea. They will die of disease, starvation, or pure mental illness. Many will be offloaded alive, thrown into the deep waters to ease navigation during the storms of the violent seas. It is on those cold Atlantic Oceans, waters, deep in the bottom of the ocean, that many carcasses of African people, their bones lay rotten in chains and swallowed by the sea. Those who survived and on arrival in the Americas were forced to work in the different plantations of white men. From the voyage ships to the plantation, the image of an inferior African was being constructed through brutal force. Then began the violent colonial conquest for settlement aimed at our natural resources that defined our native continent. The white man sought to rule Africa and here designed a system of racial segregation, racial humiliation, racial abuse that lasted for many centuries. The colony and the plantation with the voyage slave ships in the middle were the perfect technologies of recreating the African into a subservient being whose only survival in the modern world must always be through wide tutelage, supervision, and approval. The transatlantic slave trade, colonial conquest, and colonial rule are responsible for the zombification of the African soul and its intellectual damnification and the psychotic condition where Africa and its people cannot handle their affairs without white supervision. As both an intellectual project and a program of revolutionary change, Pan-Africanism is first the recognition of this terrible history which by all definition remains a world history that has cast the African into a global ident identity of inferiority amongst people of the world. Pan-Africanism is never forgotten noise of the painful cries of those captured slaves whose black bodies were swallowed by the Atlantic Ocean from the slave ships. It is the agonizing cry from the brutal violence suffered by the black slaves in the sugar, cotton, and corn plantations from Georgia to Sao Paulo. Pan-Africanism is also the resounding victory from the theater of the Haitian Revolution from 1781 to 1804, led by the greatest descendant of our continent, Toussaint Lovencho, together with his patrons, they bravely led the first and only successful slave revolution in human history. Defeating a combined European force combined, commanded by a France Napoleon Bonaparte. It is the bravery of those African former slaves who will define citizenship on a racial definition of blackness declaring that Haiti belongs to black people regardless of the color of their skin. 
Pan-Africanism is also the anger emanating from the countless defeats suffered by the Patros, the brave soldiers like those of Mau Mau and Bambata Rebellion, defeated at the hands of the brutal British colonial forces. It is the intellectual heritage of Marcus Garvey, W. E. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Har Harriet Tubman, Pixley Isaac Aseme, Charlotte Mateke, Winnie Mandela, Kwame Nkrumah, Seiko Tore, Julius Nerere, Haile Selassie, CLRA James, Franz Fanon, Thomas Sankara, and today our own Prof Lumumba, together with us, must carry the medal of the African Pan-Africanist Pan Corps. Pan-Africanism is a set of ideas written in chains with blood, spear, and the unforgiving guns of the sons and daughters from the Algerian Revolution to the Battle of Kutokonavan. It is the one-party state of Africa as a whole, as professed by Marcus Gavi. It is Ami Cesare's negritude, Kwame Nkuruma's African socialism, Steve Biko's black consciousness, Julius Nyerere Ujama. It is also Mbeki's African Renaissance, all based on forging a unity of African people who are formed by the same history and must seek after common destiny. It is the architectural achievement from the pyramid of Egypt to the cities of Mapungube. It is the industrial invasion by Garrett Morgan, traffic lights, Frederick Jones, refrigerated trucks, and Alexandra Mars, automatic elevator doors. It is the cultural movement in jazz, R&B, reggae, funk, blues, Kwaito, Juju, Nigeria, Chimorenga, Zimbabwe, Makosa, Cameroon, and Benga, Kenya. It is the novel, Things Fall Apart, The Devil on the Cross, Maru, The Trails of Brother Jeru, Songs of Solomon, and Notes of Native Son. It is the artwork of Gerald Sekoto, Chike Anyako, Oche Okeke, Edmonia Lewis, the religious movement of Bishop Lekhanyane, Manku, and Shembe, the Coptics of Egypt and the Ethiopian Orthodox Christians, as well as Islamic denominations from Tunisia, Nigeria, Kenya, all deserve a place in the rich thinking and knowledge about Africa and its people. It is true that Pan-African call has also been prophetic, carrying important cautions that those who conducted the project for the rebirth of the African continent in the post-colonial context have not heeded to. In the pages of Franz Fanon, Richard of the Earth, lays a critique which, since independent in the 1950s to this day, leaders of African people have failed to give programmatic response to this call. First and foremost, the Pan-African call is a call for African unity, not cooperation, collaboration, or coexistence. Many of you confuse the unity of Africa to mean collaboration or cooperation. We don't want to cooperate. We don't want to collaborate. We want to be one. And being one means we must share the same vision and the same direction. Yet many over the past half a century have chosen cooperation which has given way to neocolonialism. That is to say, for African leaders to continue colonialism without direct rule by colonialists. The launch of the Pan-African Institute right here in Kenya must help us intellectually to shift towards revolutionary Pan-Africanism, contribute to resolving some of the historical mistakes, blunders committed by post-liberation movements. We should state clear here that while the formation of the Organization of African Unity was a step in the right direction. The fact that the founding conference failed to unite the African continent is a historical blunder. President Kwame Nkrumah, Seko Tore, and Emperor Haile Selassie prophetically said 
that the failure to unite the African continent will give rise to the new colonialism and that African continent will perish. The revolutionary pan-Africanist ideological and political diagnosis of the, few, of the future was correct. The future is here. 50 and 50 years later, we know that we remain visitors in our own continent. We know that our resources benefit Euro-American than our own people. This is despite most African countries gaining independence from colonial rule since 1957. Massive, huge tracts of land, our mineral resources, our animals, our oceans are still owned and controlled by the colonial masters. There are no countries in the entire African continent that have gained full economic emancipation and independence. And this includes Ghana, which was the first to lead the road till to date. It can't claim that Africans in Ghana own the means of production. In 2016 report titled The New Colonialism reveals that there are 101 British companies listed on the London Stock Exchange that control an identified 1.5 trillion US dollars worth of resources in Africa in just five commodities, oil, gold, diamond, coal, and platinum. This is a very conservative figure since it includes resources listed by only some companies. Many companies do not provide the figures of the resources they control. And majority of these companies that do not tell us what they control and what they own in Africa are found in DRC. Because they are the ones who fuel the divisions in DRC. They are the ones who fuel the fight in DRC. And they are stealing the resources of DRC because they know there is no proper accountability for such resources. The war on one report on neocolonialism further illustrates that the fact that these 101 companies control and own the following key resources on our continent. 6.6 .6 billion barrels of oil currently worth 276 billion US dollars. They control 79.5 million ounces of gold worth 119 billion US dollars. They control 699.3 million currents of diamonds worth 134 billion of US dollars. 3.6 billion tons of coal worth 216 billion US dollars. 287 million ounces of platinum worth 305 billion US dollars. These are the numbers that reflect British neocolonialism in the African continent. I've not spoken about what French companies are doing. The Portuguese continue to play a significant role in the economy of Mozambique and Angola. The French continue to micromanage all the countries that were their colonies except the recent liberated zones of Mali and Burkina Faso. Comrades, the French are brutal to a point that post-colonialism, they still make certain African countries to pay colonial tax to France. The French are brutal because some of their former colonies, their reserve banks are still in France. They are not in control of their own economy, yet they claim to have an independence. We, as progressive Pan-Africanists, must fully associate with and support all revolutionary actions of fighters who are removing puppets of French imperialism from political office and power. <laughs> Not all these actions are revolutionary because we must be careful of French-sponsored coups in Africa where we think there is a revolution taking place in Guinea Conakry, only to find that there is a French puppet who seek to replace those who were there before. There is nothing revolutionary about the Guinea Conakry uh, coup. We ought to separate 
that there can never be a revolutionary coup that reinforces French imperialism on African soil. Anyone who comes into political office under the pretext that they are fighting a French puppet while knowing they are the French puppet themselves must be isolated by progressive pan-Africanists. All French soldiers and military must leave the African continent and this also should apply to neo-colonial military bases including the African Command Center of the USA. We don't want the Army of America, we don't want the Army of France here, we don't want the Army of anyone. We want African Army on African soil. The Pan-Africanist Institute should therefore provide ideological, political and te technical weapons to all progressive forces of the African continent to fight against colonialism. There is a political trend that is being accepted by African heads of state and government where one country convenes all 54 heads of African states and government. The United States of America, France, China, Russia, and United Kingdom convene all 54 heads of states and government for a meeting and they all go following each other like Casey and Jojo as a heads of states to listen to one head of state, 51 of them. Sometimes they disrespect them to a point where they put all 54 heads of states of Africa in a school bus to go and listen to one head of state. What happened to these men because all of them, majority of them are men? What happened to these fathers? who go and bow combined to one man even if it's Putin why would they all follow each other and go and listen to one person what happened to their dignity and their authority as leadership they must have leadership qualities to know that Putin is equal to them that China is equal to their own single country irrespective of their size because what matters is sovereignty and if China recognizes that sovereignty will respect the president of that sovereign country as an individual comrade Kwame Nkrumah noticed this when he said that neocolonialism also means the following. Breaking up former large united colonial territories into a number of small non-viable states incapable of independent development. An external directed economic system and political policy. The state being obligated to take the manufactured products of the imperialist power to the exclusion of competing products from elsewhere. Payments towards the cost of running the state to ensure control over government policies and foreign capital is used for the exploitation rather than the development of less developed regions. Governor, on my way here, we saw how the people here are working the land. We saw that there is no piece of land here that is not being utilized to the benefit of our people. But the question remains, where do these people sell these things? Because they can't consume all of them. Yes, they must produce to feed themselves and feed the whole Kenya and feed the continent and the world. Is the government buying food that is produced fresh from this soil or do you have companies that are owned by white people in Nairobi who bring finished products into the land that has got products that can be bought directly from our own people? We say people must work the land. After they work the land, their own governments in Africa do not procure from those people. For because if it does not have a white color, they don't like it. Our leaders like their colonizers more than us. That's why they always seek after anything that looks like colonizers. Ten years ago, we as revolutionary activists and visionaries from south of African continent started the revolutionary socialist movement and pan-Africanist movement, the EFF, Economic Freedom Fighters. 
when we formed the EFF in South Africa, we told them that our organization is not for South Africa. Our organization is for all Africans. And we said this. We said this during xenophobic attacks of our people in South Africa where people were being attacked because they come from outside South Africa. We chose to side with our people because we're necessitated by the fact that we love ourselves. And if you love yourself, you'll see a person from Tanzania in you. You'll see a person from Nigeria in you because we are one thing. We as the Economic Emancipation Movement did not only say we are Pan-Africanist. In one of our cardinal pillars, we said South Africa must engage in massive investment of economic development in Africa. Because if you keep on saying people are coming to South Africa, are looking for jobs, are going to take jobs from us, we can stop this thing of people coming to South Africa. How do you do it? Go and build massive economic development in African countries so that people can stay where they are and they can feed themselves from where they are. No one wants to leave his own home into some strange place. We live leave our homes because we are searching for greener pastures. If there is an ESCOM in South Africa which is failing to give us electricity, but when it was well and still running according to how we wanted it, ESCOM had the capacity to electrify the whole of Africa. Why are you not going into the African continent and electrify the whole of Africa? Why is there no a train that moves from Cape to Cairo, making sure that trade in Africa and movement of goods and persons is easy. Because if we do that, there is no one who can leave Lusaka to go and stay in South Africa. They can get into a train, go and do what they want to do in South Africa, and come back home and develop their own countries. We must make sure that this Africa is linked together. We must violently demolish the borders that exist between our countries because those are not our borders. You cannot worship a border between Tanzania and Kenya and come and sit in this wall and say you are a Pan-Africanist. A Pan-Africanist means the first task is to get rid of colonial borders so that we bring Africa together in practical terms. I don't know if President William Ruto means it because he said so many things and I can't locate him these days because the things he said during election and the things he's doing now are two different things. I don't know. Because I heard him saying we need to do away with the dollar and build our own currency. But his actions are not speaking to anything of doing away with the dollar. The latest being putting a red carpet for a murderer. A person who killed the Kenyan people coming into this country, receiving a red carpet and being saluted by our own army. This is not a Kenyan army, it's not a colonialist army. The Kenyan army is a product of the Mau Mau rebellion. And those who killed our people in the Mau Mau rebellion cannot be saluted by the same army of the children of those who were killed during Mau Mau rebellion. We have a duty to stay true to the cause. We have a duty to remind the king and Britain of what they did to us. Indeed, he shows no remorse. He says this was bad. It shouldn't have happened. But he runs short of, I apologize. I am sorry. 
he will never say he is sorry for because he thinks that his race makes him superior and he's not qualified to apologize to those who are junior to him we call upon the the kenyan government to be firm and to decide what they want to be do they want to be pan-Africanist or do they want to be proponents of neo-colonialism? You can't have it both. Only one call must be made and that call is of pan-Africanism. It's not easy being a pan-Africanist for because the mindset of our people is so colonized, they are going to isolate you. They are going to look at you as if you are a mad person. They are going to look at you as if you are unreasonable. But it is a cause worth pursuing because of the generation that came before us. We don't want uh, visas. We want one currency for Africa. Because our currency, our currency can be more powerful than the pound and the dollar combined because London has got the biggest storage of gold yet they don't have a single smallest mine of gold their economy is based on our minerals and if we safeguard our minerals and protect them and say out of these minerals we are producing a currency that is going to compete internationally we stand a good chance we need african central bank we need african monetary zone we need african military combat because these pockets of wars that are happening in africa are not of our own making they are sponsored wars so that those who continue to steal our resources can do so uninterrupted as we fight ourselves amongst ourselves so we need a military a common defense system the african high command that will ensure the stability and security of africa we equally need a biting african court to deal with dictators who only exist in africa to feed their friends and families those people must be prosecuted the african way because isis is not meant to fight any crime it's meant to pursue political fights that's why isis will not declare a warrant of arrest against Netanyahu but can declare a warrant of arrest against Putin who has not bombed a hospital, who has not bombed a refugee camp, who has not declared a war on a certain ethnic group. We as revolutionary economic emancipation movement also associate with, the, with what Guinea's president Seko Tora said in 1963 he said above all we must avoid the pitfalls of tribalism there is tribalism taking place in DRC all our leaders have taken a platform to support or to be against this one or that one they have spoken on Palestine they have spoken on the war between Russia and Ukraine. But I've, I'm still to hear the stand of President William Ruto about the ongoing war that is not covered by anyone in DRC where people are fighting over territorial expansion and plunder of resources and blacks are killing other black people and we pretend that like, that we don't see it's important as leaders of states and governments to always condemn violence and war especially if it's barbaric and informed by tribalism and unjustifiable territorial expansions before you can speak about other countries 
Charity begins at home. Let there be peace in DRC. Without peace in DRC, Kenya will never know peace. Because these rascals are going to learn from those wars in DRC and want to import them into Kenya. You have a duty to stop them there before they come into Kenya. <laughs> Comrades, we will make sure we the struggle of all immigrants, most of whom are economic migrants and asylum seekers in South Africa. We will never. In South Africa, they say to us, if you want to be elected, you must declare war on illegal immigrants. And illegal immigrants, they mean Africans. We have refused as the EFF that we will never declare war on, on any immigrant, illegal or legal, illegal according to whose law. Because if you are illegal, you should have violated a certain law. Which African law did these people violate when they came to this side of Africa? Because they are still in the same territory of Africa. They are at home when they are in South Africa. We wish to tell them we are going to elections next year in South Africa. We wish to reiterate that and we tell them all the time. If they want to elect us on the basis of xenophobia, they can keep their votes. We are not disparate for votes. We are disparate for the unity of Africa. And that's what we want to achieve in our lifetime. Remove the visas as an immediate step and I heard Kenya is going to do that by December. Perhaps I must come back here in December unannounced. So to test if indeed President William Root means exactly what he said. When he said there won't be visas in December. Maybe I must sneak in and test without applying for any visa and just give them the South African passport and say I'm coming home. <laughs> Mama, we want to commit in front of you and all the dignitaries who are here and the students that this Pan-African Institute will be supported by the EFF. We will ensure that indeed it has got a home in South Africa. We will not only support it verbally, we will put money into it, we will pay the staff members of the institute, we will also pay the offices of the institute because we believe that we must speak one language as Africa. We will donate the books here at the university to ensure that every African writer has got his or her book in the Pan-Africanist Institute. Let's all spread the gospel. Indeed, it was not a mistake to launch it here in the rural areas because no one must be left behind. If you can carry on your back the rural communities, you have no any other option to go anywhere except to go to the urban. But if you start from rural, there is no way you can cover the urban. But if you start from the urban, you are going to be reluctant to come to the rural. We are starting here to liberate our people in the rural areas and we are going to the urban to ensure that everybody hears the message. Tell President Ruto that the people of Palestine are what Mau Mau was. Tell President Ruto that the people of South Africa are what Palestinian people are today. Where our land that get encroached, where our land just get taken and we get killed on our own land, we get tortured on our own land, we get imprisoned on our own land. When we fight, they say we are terrorists. This Nelson Mandela you celebrate for 27 years. He was in prison because he was a terrorist. 
What crime did he commit which the Palestinians are not committing? His crime was to fight for the liberation of the people of South Africa and the oppressed world all over, including the people of Palestine. It can be correct that President Ruto, knowing the history of this country and the history of South Africa, comes and tells us that is with Israelites. Our war is not on Jewish people. Our war is not on pregnant women, Jewish pregnant women. Our war is not on Jewish children. Our war is against a Zionist apartheid state of Israel. And that's what we are fighting. So if you got money from some Jewish person, we are not fighting that funder of his. We are fighting the state of Israel. We are not fighting individuals. We are fighting the state of Israel. At the age of nine years, the Boers walked into my house and turned everything upside down, stripped my mother naked. When I see what those children of Palestine are going through, I can immediately relate that this is what apartheid looks like. We cannot be pan-Africanist if we can't associate with the oppressed nation. Our pan-Africanism is based on the basis that we are an oppressed nation ourselves. And everywhere else where we see an oppressed person, that person is our sister, that person is our mother, that person is our father, because we are not free until the whole world is free from imperialism and colonialism. I don't know if you'll regret inviting me after this. But my problem is that I tell my truth as is. And I say it to authorities without fear or favor. Till today, no one has ever sued me legally successful. Till today, no one has imprisoned me. Because you can't imprison or sue the truth. The truth will always prevail. Comrades, we must make sure that as we live here, our sympathy is with the oppressed people. Look at Cuba. Its crime was to choose a different economic system to what America has chosen. And then they are under more than 60 years of economic embargo. What did crime did the people of Western Sahara commit against Morocco? We are at the center of speaking the truth as a Pan-Africanist Institute because we've got the ear of the continent and the diaspora and the whole world. And this organization we are launching today, Prof, will live forever and ever because you only speak the truth yourself to power. And you always make us politicians to want to check if indeed we are still on the right track. So an institution established by a person like you, we are guaranteed that it will live for long and it will live for generations to come. That's why we are proud to be here. I was not brought by a plane here. I was not brought by a car here. I was driven by the spirits of those people who were dumped in the oceans. And when they were dumping them in the oceans, their cries are still crying loud till today. They did not dump them in the ocean only. They dumped them chained on their hands and their feet and they could not fight. They, when the sharks were f eating them in those oceans, they could not fight. Even if you know that today I'm going to die. But it is always good to die fighting. That you must hold a shark. Even when you know it's going to swallow me, I must, I must die fighting. Those people who died in the ocean said to me, you ought to arrive there. For because what you guys are going to start there is that which is going to seek reparations for us. 
as you leave this place and going back to your home remember the people who died in the plantation beaten treated like dogs remember all of those slaves that asked for help and they never found help but you must say to them in spirit the help has, has arrived and that help we declare today that will fight the battles of the heroes and heroines of Mau Mau, of Bambata Rebellion, of the slaves. This Pan-Africanist Institute must be at the center of demanding reparations for all the suffering Africans have gone through because of colonialism. We must teach our people that we are not beggars. When we ask for reparation, we are not asking for donation. We are asking for what was stolen from us to be returned so that we can prosper and become a better nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.